and Laverne Cox takes the stage at the United States Conference on AIDS, San Diego, California. The standing ovation in the Pat Ballroom. Populations 50 times more likely, but we're still not sure. Now, it's my belief that, that one of the biggest obstacles facing the transgender community are, are points of view that disavow our identities, points of view that continually erase us, that suggest that we are always and only the gender that we were assigned at birth. And it is those points of view that continually erase us. About um, 14 years ago, I, I, I was leaving a nightclub in Manhattan, where I now call home. 
the best that I did at the time. I went to a night clubs. <laughs> and I, I was approached by, by a couple of people who said, would you like to participate in this HIV AIDS study? And they said, they said to me that, you know, we'll, we'll give you $50 and a, and a metro card. And at the time, I needed that $50 and a metro card. <laughs> I was, at this time, it was a couple of years into my, my gender transition, so I was presenting as a trans woman and, and living full time as a trans woman. I started my medical transition, so I go in for, for the study. I go in and, and they tell me that this is a study of men who have sex with men. And, I, and I'm like, look, call you the woman that you are, but would you still like to participate? We'll give you $50 in the metro card. <laughs> <laughs> and since I needed that $50 in the metro card, I took part in the study. <laughs> and, and, and I look back on it, and I'm like, it, and it pains me to think about that five years. I participated in that study for five years, so I would go in twice a year to get tested for, for HIV, and I would fill out a questionnaire about my sexual practices for that past six months. And, I, and what was wonderful about the study is that I found out a lot of important information about post-exposure prophylaxis, for example, information that I probably would not have known about had I not participated in the study. I found out about cutting-edge treatments for HIV and AIDS, and that was really wonderful. But, but when I look back on that, I think about how many trans people out there enter health, various healthcare circumstances and are misgendered and or who have their, their gender identity erased. And, and a lot of trans folks are not gonna go, even for $50 in a metro card, into a study that disavows, that erases their identity. <laughs> and, and they shouldn't have to. There needs to be more spaces that fully acknowledge who we are and acknowledge that we are the women that we say we are, that we are the, the trans men for some of us who say we are, or that we might not identify as either or both. And that is so fundamentally important to making sure that transgender people are counted when we, when we look at the people who are still affected most by this, by this epidemic. Um, and and HIV AIDS has been a reality for me my entire adult life, my entire sexual life. I, I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. And, and I was a church going youngster. And for some days, we were members of the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. I unfortunately learned in church that because I was assigned male at birth, any sex that I might have with a man was not only a sin, it was blasphemy. It meant that I was going to hell. And my entire life, I really believed that because of the HIV AIDS epidemic, that I was destined to die. There has always been this, this, this air of inevitability that because of who I am eventually, I will test positive for HIV AIDS. And there has been such a tremendous amount of shame and stigma that has surrounded me and sex my whole life my entire life, and, and when I think about that, is, is a person who stands here today somehow still HIV negative, and I feel weird even saying that. I feel weird even, I, I, I tell you, I feel weird even saying that because, it's, because we live in a world that often assumes that because I am black and trans, I must be <coughs> HIV positive. And that, that stigma, that stigma is, is so crippling. It's been so crippling to me as I go out into the world and, and look for love and affection. Now, now the very first time I had, I had sex with him was I was 17 years old, and I was armed. I was a smart kid. I knew everything there was to know about condoms and, and lubrication, proper lubrication, and I knew that I was supposed to protect myself and I knew how to protect myself. Yet, the very first time that I had sexual intercourse, I did not use a condom. 
and I have so much shame about that. I have so much shame sharing this in front of you. Oh, I'm learning how to move a A lot of shame about that. And there's still so much stigma that we have around sex and around sexuality and what constitutes safer sex in this, in this country. And, and I don't feel like we're talking about it. And, and I feel like it's so important that, that, that we have open discussions about the shame that we stigma that we might experience still with all that we know around sex and sexuality in this country. Um, it's, it's, I, you know, I, and I think about I, where I just went now in my head is all the people who I've known who, who I know now, who are living with HIV, who are violently suppressed. People who I've lost um, in my life to HIV AIDS, and, 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 and the ones who fought, and the ones, a uh, dear friend of mine, who, who didn't want anyone to know, a trans woman, didn't want anyone to know that she was HIV positive, and so she hid it, and she didn't go and seek attention, um, medical attention, and she, and she passed away because of stigma and because of shame. And, and, and when I think about that, I think that there is so much more work that we have to do to begin to lift the stigma and the shame around HIV. Because stigma and shame can kill us. It really, really can. Stigma and shame can kill us. But, but, but I, I'm so moved. By, by all of the work that each and every one of you are doing every day. I know of so many of you who are doing that work to, to have those difficult conversations, to lift the shame, to realize that, that, that our, our AIDS activist forebears over 30 years ago could call for our government to, to, to make you know, this, this epidemic call for make it a state of emergency. They reminded us that HIV AIDS is a social justice issue. Yeah. about all of those who are being left behind, we have to remember that we have to begin to fight poverty, as already been stated today. We have to decriminalize sex work. <laughs> if we are serious about ending HIV AIDS, we have to decriminalize sex work. Practices of using condoms as evidence of sex work are practices that we experience here in the United States disproportionately. Now, there are, there are places like Washington, D.C. who have banned this practice, which is amazing, but, but I wonder, does the community know, particularly the trans community, who trans women are disproportionately profiled as sex workers, whether they're sex workers or not, and do we, do we have that information? So much of, of, of what I notice as I talk to trans folks all over the country and people who are affected most by this is that there are places, the work that you're doing, you're doing the work to make spaces safer for trans people to identify as themselves. You're doing that work. You're doing work to, to overturn policies that would um, have condoms be used as evidence of sex work, which is detrimental to ending the spread of this virus. But the community doesn't the community doesn't know about this vital work that is being done. So the outreach is so vitally important. How do we get that message to the community? It's such a such an important point and, and moment that's, that needs to be a part of our mandate so that we, we let everybody know about the amazing work and that there are indeed safe spaces. And, and for those places that purport to be safe for transgender people but might not be, there's more work that needs to be done. Because it's, we're still, it's still a state of emergency for far too many trans people across this country. But again, we are a resilient people. We have fought insurmountable odds to, to find and develop life saving medications to fight this, this, this disease, this, this, this virus. And I believe that we can continue to fight the fight and to end this virus. But we have to make sure that no one is left behind. We have to reach out to those people who are incarcerated. And we have to make sure that the implementation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act is um, implemented, all, implemented all across the country to make sure that every, just because you're incarcerated does not mean that you should not be protected. Um, <laughs> does not mean that you should not be protected from transmitting the virus. And if you 
do as a all living provider is that you get the life saving medication that you need. So, so I, I'm really honored and excited to share space with all of you and to hear about the amazing work that you're doing and, and to continue to fight with you. And in, in, in this moment, this mandate, thank you so much for having me.